So thanks. I'm going to talk about uh, superconducting qubits, which is a, a little off topic. Um, and in fact, I am kind of doubly off topic from my normal comfort zone. I'm actually an experimental neutrino physicist. And so uh, it's actually, I, I think, irrelevant to hear the story about how I find myself here talking about superconducting qubits. So I'll tell you that story. Uh, give a brief introduction to super, superconducting devices, which we have not had yet at this atomic physics workshop. Uh, and then the real problem I want to talk about is the problem of quasi-particle poisoning in superconducting qubit devices, uh, what we believe to be the hypothesis, and in fact, uh, the experiment we've done to, to at least partially confirm that hypothesis. So uh, just to start at the beginning, how I got here, I, I was, I'm trying to measure the mass of the neutrino, which is on its face completely irrelevant. Um, you measure the mass of the neutrino by what's called the tritium endpoint method. You measure the, the beta electrons from tritium beta decay and just the last few electron volts near the, the highest energy endpoint. And you look for a deviation and you can see the difference between the, the, the dashed line, which is the spectrum you get if neutrinos have no mass, and the spectrum you would get uh, if the neutrino had one, one electron volt of mass in red, uh, which is actually the current limit on neutrino mass. To do that, you need very precise spectroscopy. And so we have developed on a small prototype scale, a technique called cyclotron radiation emission spectroscopy that works by having tritium beta decay in a magnetic field of about a Tesla. The electrons are trapped in that magne magnetic field. They do a cyclotron motion and because they're in accelerating charge, they radiate. They radiate at that cyclotron frequency. It's about a femtowatt of power at 26 gigahertz. So very low power at microwave frequencies. And so my interest in quantum technology is really just as, as a dumb consumer. I want amplifiers, microwave amplifiers with the lowest possible noise, preferably the standard quantum limit. And so we had actually reached out to, to Will Oliver at MIT to ask about Josephson traveling wave parametric amplifiers, which are commonly used to read out superconducting qubit devices just for signal to noise reasons in our neutrino experiment. That's all I was in it for. Um, so just real quickly, uh, a, a TUPA, a traveling wave parametric amplifier for short, is just this uh, transmission line repeating periodic structures of capacitors, inductors, and importantly, Josephson junctions, which have this nonlinear inductance. Uh, they can be fabricated. That is a real device, five by five. And they give you high gain. So high gain for me is everything above 20 decibels over a wide bandwidth. The key for me being wide bandwidth and high gain. So. I need a few hundred megahertz of bandwidth at 26 gigahertz. And you see this has got the sufficient gain over a couple of gigahertz minus this suck out near, uh, this is a pump frequency. It's a four wave mixing device. And so you can operate right at the pump frequency, but that's all right. I only need a few hundred megahertz, which I can get over there. Now, this device is at seven gigahertz. These are made for qubits that operate typically at below 10. I need it at 26 gigahertz. But the operating frequency is just determined by the values of these conductors, uh, capacitors and inductors to get 26 gigahertz is you, you can just make them comfortably within the range that you can make them. We're, we're sure that will work, but we haven't done it yet. Oh, and the, the, the noise performance of this, that device is 700 millikelvin is the noise temperature. And I'll compare that. I keep pushing this button like it's going to do something to my computer. Sorry. So just to compare that with the, the, what I believe to be the best hemp amplifiers you can get, which have an effective noise temperature of about 10 Kelvin versus if I kept everything in my experiment the same, except I replaced those hemp, that's a high electron mobility transistor with a tupa with 740 millikelvin of noise temperature. I'm plotting here two cases. So I have an electron in the center of a circular ring of antennas. So I'm using antennas to collect that radiation. That's the radius of a circular array versus the number of antenna elements I stuff on that array. I actually can only fit values below the black lines. And you can see the good signal to noise, which are the redder colors, come way down and to the right. So I can do this for a fixed antenna array. I can either get better signal to noise or I can get the same signal to noise with a bigger antenna array which helps me have more tritium in my experiment, which I actually need to do for statistical sensitivity. The difference for every point on this is about 10 decibels. That's a, a huge amount of signal to noise gain. 
the vertical axis is, I should have drawn a picture, sorry. So imagine a circular ring of antennas. It's like a phased array, but it's looking in on itself. And so that's the radius of the circle. That's the number of antennas I put on that circle. And there's some assumption in there about the directivity of the antennas. <laughs> Doesn't work. There, that works. And, and so, you know, I'm a nuclear physicist. I want to just be a consumer of quantum information technology. Um, but, but I wonder if there's anything I can give back. And, and, and as it turns out, there is. And th this was purely lucky. I, I don't even remember how it came up. But in, in the course of working with Will Oliver about these amplifiers, he told us about the problem he has with the qubits he reads out with these amplifiers. He says, you know, these qubits, theoretically, they should have much longer coherence times than they do. Uh, they're limited. They're, there's way too many quasi-particles. That's broken Cooper pairs, free electrons. Um, we don't know where all these quasi-particles come from. They're in every device. Doesn't matter what the material is, how you operate them, who does it. It's always there. It's universal. Almost everything you could think of that would do that has been ruled out. One of the only things left that has not been ruled out is just radiation from the environment. Cosmic rays, the radioactivity that's in normal stuff. Um, and, and it's not a small excess. It's like five to six orders of magnitude more broken Cooper pairs than what you should get from BCS theory. It should be vanishingly small, and it is not. And so our hypothesis is that environmental radiation, that's cosmic rays and just natural stuff in the environment, which is mostly potassium, uranium, and thorium, uh, enters the device and breaks Cooper pairs. Now, back to being a neutrino physicist for a minute. I told you about neutrino mass. One of the more urgent problems in neutrino physics of the day is the search for this process called neutrinoless double beta decay. We actually had a good introduction to this yesterday in the colloquium. If you observe neutrinoless double beta decay at any level, it is incontrovertible proof that neutrinos are Majorana particles. If neutrinos are Majorana particles, that's, that cleans up very nicely major problems in particle physics and cosmology, you know, up to and including how we come to live in a universe full of matter instead of antimatter. So it, there, it's worth a lot of effort. The effort, well, well, so just to set the scale of the effort, it's a very rare process. I mean, maybe it's completely forbidden if neutrinos are not Majorana particles. The half-life sensitivities of current experiments that have looked for this are like 10 to the 25 to 10 to the 26 years. That's like the age of the universe squared. The goal for the next phase of experiments, which is coming in the next few years, is, is to expose more material. Oh, sorry. Uh, you measure exposure in these experiments by its kilogram years is the current exposure. So how many kilograms of the candidate isotope times how long did you do the exposure? Current exposures are 10 to 100 kilogram years. The goal is ton years, so tons of material exposed for years of exposure to get 10 to the 28 year half-life sensitivity. Um, and because it's so rare, you have to control the background events in such an experiment to the level of one count per ton of material per year. One count per ton per year, and you have to expose tons of the stuff for reference, if you're not used to thinking and being paranoid about how radioactive everything in the world is, one fingerprint gives you 10 counts per year. So one fingerprint anywhere on your detector completely ruins your ton scale experiment. Most of the blunders you make actually involve putting all five of your fingers somewhere. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really severe. And so we do things that approach the ludicrous. Uh, one of the things we do, this is one of our analytical chemists, we actually grow our own copper. We grow our own copper deep underground so it won't be activated once we make it cleanly. Uh, this, is a, this is an electro-forming bath. Uh, it looks like the stuff I used to flush down my toilet in Seattle to kill the roots that would grow into my septic system. Um, you can actually grow copper in such a way that it excludes all other metals. Uh, and this shows the effect of, uh, this is a germanium detector used in an early neutrinoless double beta decay search. Uh, you can see the effects of first just switching from normal materials to clean materials and doing a little bit of shielding and then going 1,400 meters underground to get away from cosmic rays. You can see you get orders of magnitude reduction in background materials. Now, so the moral of the story is if you have trouble with radiation in your environment and you've just told this to a bunch of neutrino physicists, we have totally solved this problem. We, we, we know what we should do. And so now the, the real talk about superconducting qubits. And, and, and we'll come back to why all that matters. 
So superconducting computes come in a few different flavors. They just depend on how the, the architecture of the device and how you read them out. The, the, the thing they all have in common is the presence of at least one Josephson junction, which has its inherent device inductance and capacitance and whatever inductors and capacitors you add in the circuit to make it work like an electronic element. That is a resonant structure. And importantly, it's not a harmonic oscillator, it's an anharmonic oscillator because that uh, intrinsic junction inductance is, is nonlinear. So rather than having, uh, it's a little blurry, but in the light gray, there's a harmonic oscillator, you know from undergrad quantum that those transitions are all degenerate. You can't individually, you can't independently address them but in an anharmonic oscillator, the transition frequencies are unique. You can, uniquely, you can uniquely address transitions like in an atom. And in particular, you can use the ground state and the first excited state as uh, zero and one of your qubit. So superconducting qubits have been having a Moore's law for at least the last 15 years, uh, up to the level of, of, they're approaching 100 microseconds now, actually exceeding in, in, in the state of the art cases. They, uh, you know, that, that's design improvements, material improvements. There are lots of understood ways that you can lose coherence by just, just ways to exchange energy with your environment. Some of them are very well understood and some of them are not very well understood. Of the ones that are not very well understood are the problem of quasi particles, free electrons, not Cooper pairs, tunneling through the junction. And just to be clear, it's not that we don't understand what a quasi particle does when it goes through the junction. We don't understand why there are so many quasi particles. It's just the number of quasi particles is the problem. So quasi particles are, are they have a really distinct imprint and, and, and they're really pernicious because they follow, the effect follows this double exponential form. And so we'll define the polarization as you know, the probability that you, you put a qubit into its one state and at some time t later you find it still to be in the one state. Uh, naively, if you have normal decoherence mechanisms, it will follow an exponential law, that's that factor. But quasi-particles give you this extra factor which depends on uh, the effective density of quasi-particles and this extra t one time. And you'll notice this exponential is in the argument of that exponential, so it's an e to the e to the. And so you see that kick up in a plot of the of the polarization for a real device and where naively you might have a 55 microsecond coherence time in this device from normal mechanisms because of the double exponential even for a really small number of quasi particles in the device uh, the, the, the 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 coherence time the one over e time the time you drop to one over e, your polarization is actually only eight microseconds so you, you get a huge loss in coherence time there are tricks you can play with like you know, there are pulse sequences that can do dynamic suppression to get you some modest improvement. You can actually, you can encourage these quasi particles to leave the region faster than they come in, but you can only get like a few times longer. You're still limited to microseconds and you're doing pulses that are not the gate operations you want to be doing on your device. Preferably, you should just get rid of the quasi particles. It still doesn't work. One of these times it's gonna happen. <clears throat> So a uh, little background, I, and, and so this is a condensed matter theory paper. I, I, I'm only qualified to quote lines of the paper to you. Uh, so from this paper, uh, the, 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 there is some reason to believe that you can actually have a significant quasi-particle excess, even if the generating mechanism is extremely rare. And so they have some simple model where it's called the bursting bubbles model, where you have quasi-particles appear in your device uh, a and B, A will tend to annihilate by recombining with some other, making a new Cooper pair. If one appears at B though, you'll increase the quasi-particle density by one. The meat of the paper is really in the rate at which that happens in the radius that matters for recombination. But one of the things they do, and, and this is the first statement in a peer reviewed paper I can find for the hypothesis is that uh, they take their model and do an estimate assuming only cosmic rays depositing energy, which is fully converted into quasi particles. And they find actually that uh, the, the rate of energy deposition of cosmic rays would roughly explain the quasi particle excess. And so that's really tantalizing. Still didn't work. 
Uh, another, an experimental paper to, to, to give us further evidence. I mean, we know it can't be BCS thermally generated quasi particles. There's just too many. And so here is some evidence that, the, that, that that is definitely the case. And so these people find in a transmon cubic device, uh, quasi particle loss in our devices is on equal footing with all other loss mechanisms. The measured rate of excitation events is greater than that of relaxation events which signifies that the quasi-particles are more energetic than would be predicted from a thermal distribution. And so in their transmon device, you can actually see different tunneling events where you either, you can give energy to the junction, you can take energy to the junction, or you can do it uh, adiabatically. That might not be the right word for that one, but you can actually see individual tunneling events because the ground state and the first excited state actually change uh, parity, depending on the number of charges there. So they can count those and then the key result, uh, these are highly derived. So they're showing you a ratio of energy relaxation rates, which are just one over the coherence times. What you would expect if these were just thermally generated versus what they actually measure. And you see only at, at temperatures way above the device temperature. So the device temperature is like 40 millikelvin. Only at about 150 to 200 do you start coming back to what you expect thermally. Um, so the, the, the conclusion is, is, is that this excess population is hot. It is definitely not thermally generated. They're, they're, they're much more energetic than that. So what do we think is going on? So here's, here's a kind of a cartoon of, of our model, which is very qualitative. We do not have a good microscopic quantitative model of what's going on yet. But you have uh, radiations from the environment, beta plus, beta minus, x-rays, charged particles, can interact directly in thin layers of superconductor uh, and break Cooper pairs. That's actually a fairly well understood process. X -ray, low energy X-rays will do a similar thing. Higher energy X-rays though will tend to penetrate a thin layer of superconductor, interact in the silicon substrate, make phonons. There's a shower that eventually ends in phonons which permeate the device, couple back into the superconductor and still have enough energy to, to pull these apart. It only takes like less than a milli EV to pull these apart and we've got KEVs coming in. Uh, so that's just a cartoon of the energy scales of the different processes. So you cascade through all these electron hole pairs, phonons, photons, and then down to quasi particles. And so there, there's a, a pretty simple experiment you can do. You just expose a, a qubit to more radiation and see if you can make its performance degrade. And ideally, uh, we should do this with a source that will decay quickly, like copper-64. Uh, copper-64 has a half-life that's long enough that we can handle it and do the experiments we need to do, but short enough that in one cycling of a deal fridge, you can do the whole experiment you want to do. Uh, the, there's some unrepeatability associated just with cycling a deal fridge. We don't want to do that. And so we actually activated a piece of natural copper in the reactor at MIT, quickly brought it over to the lab, uh, inserted into the dill fridge, spent a couple of days cooling down, and then still had plenty of activity left to just watch this thing work. So the main decays of copper 64 are these, uh, it's kind of blurry, there's a beta plus and a beta minus branch, and so you can get some charged particles and some x-rays. Uh, the beta plus mostly just annihilate and give you a 511 x-ray. So you can get both kinds of radiation into the device, and we placed it right above. So there's this copper holder. The copper source that we activated is right there. And then that lid closes, that is the qubit device. So just a few millimeters above, we've got copper 64 shining right on it. These are the devices. The crosses are the qubits. You can see the resonators used to, to read out and control them and then another resonator used to couple them. We actually don't, we don't do any coupling in this experiment. And so the, the, the physics model to be a little more qualitative is, is you know, there's this polarization that goes to e to the minus gamma t. Now that gamma is a complex function that can give you the double exponential for the quasi-particle contribution. Uh, so there's the quasi-particle part and everything else, the, the, normal, the parts that give you the normal exponential. And we can model the, the, the rate at which we make quasi-particles. Uh, it's proportional to the frequency of the qubit and then the total power into the device, uh, square root of that and then some parameter A, because I don't know how efficiently radiation couples the quasi-particles. So there's some free parameter that I'm gonna determine from the experiment. Um, the power into the, to the device has three parts. There's some internal radiation, external in the source. The internal 
is, is stuff inside the fridge. So, you know, resistors are radioactive, all that stuff. There are like IR photons coming down the lines as we actually heard in the last talk, those can break Cooper pairs. There's external radiation. That's, that's the stuff from the environment. Uh, in our case, it's about 60% from the concrete walls of the lab we're in and 40% from cosmic rays. I'll show you the plot next. And then there's the copper 64 source that we added on top of all that to, to perturb what you, would, what you would do in an uncontrolled experiment. And so for people that are not used to looking at this, this is a, a totally typical radiation spectrum measured in the lab. This is actually measured at the location of the qubit in the lab. And you can see the, the black is the total measurement and it's fitted with potassium. So that's the, the common 1440 KeV potassium line, uh, uranium and thorium, and then all the daughters of uranium and thorium that, that stay in the stuff. And it fits quite well. And then cosmic rays at higher energies. So we did the experiment. Uh, I'm showing you now the energy relaxation rate, which is just one over the coherence time. Uh, so the coherence time goes up, relaxation rate goes down as a function of time as this copper 64 source decays with its 12.7 hour half-life. Each one of these measurements of, of energy relaxation rate is actually, there, there's a, a lot of measurements that go into that. So one of those points is determined by a fit to this polarization. This is that polarization curve. You can just see the double exponential kick at the bottom there. Goes into each one of those. It takes a few minutes to make that and we can make that fast enough that we can do it repeatedly while the source is decaying. This is the total power into the superconducting materials of the device uh, based on the modeling that we did and the known calibrated activity of that source. Mostly copper, but um, it is a curse of nuclear physics that the trace impurities that come in pure metals also have really big neutron activation cross sections. So you end up with a lot of gold 198 at the later time. That's why this doesn't flatten out. There's actually a longer lived piece there. And so the correlation is quite clear. So this is versus time. Uh, to, to, to learn something about our model, I'm now plotting it as uh, so the same energy relaxation rate versus the, 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 the dose of radiation we're putting in. And this is just from the source, not the external things. Or excuse me, this is the cosmic rays, concrete, and the source. At long times, high powers, it's totally dominated by the source term. And I can use that to get my parameter A, which is some unknown constant. And it's an unknown kind of coupling constant plus some other dimensionful constants. Um, and I can use that and then combine it with an estimate from modeling using a standard tool we do for radiation modeling and nuclear physics to come up with the external amount of radiated power. And I can point that back and say, if you were to take away all the other decoherence mechanisms, what would be the limit set by environmental radiation? And by pointing this line back, I find that it's about four milliseconds. So a little different for each of my qubits, but about the same. So if you solved all the other problems in superconducting qubits, you would be stuck with four milliseconds because of radiation. Uh, now, another conclusion you can make from this, here's the power we estimate uh, from just being in a lab on the surface. You notice that we've petered out before we hit that. And so, Clearly, this is not the current limit on coherence time. Something else is, is really the current limit on coherence times. Radiation might be the thing after that. Remember, we're at like 100 microseconds. This comes in at the few millisecond scales. So a different variation to that experiment is you, you can add radiation. But you can also take radiation away with shielding. Sorry, this one still doesn't work. So uh, we actually then repeated the experiment. Uh, no copper 64 radiation added inside the shield, but we, we put lead shielding around the outside and we can measure with the shield down. That's a, that's a lift jack that can put that lead shield. Uh, they're, they're wrapped in green tape is why it doesn't look like lead. We can surround the fridge. The qubits are right about there. That's Will Oliver for people that don't know. And now the effect's gonna be small, right? So we have to do this carefully. So one of the things, just to improve our statistics, we used the original two qubits and we added another board with seven more, or excuse me, five more for seven total qubits on it. And there are other things that cause the performance of qubits to drift on like the minutes to hours scale. And so you can't just like measure for a long time with the shield up and then measure for a long time with the shield down. We gotta do this fast cycling and take 
adjacent kind of time adjacent measurements. So we put the shield down, measure, put it up, measure, and take the difference. And we're going to histogram those differences in relaxation rates. Um, we reduce with the shield down, you, you take away about 2% of the radiation and you know, it's shielding the stuff from the floor, but with it up, we block about 46% of the radiation. Basically does nothing to cosmic rays, but gets rid of most of the concrete radiation. So that's the slow drift I was talking about. So if I just averaged all those time up, which are the blue and all the time down, you, it, you would see nothing. And so I, I, I take adjacent differences. I put them in that histogram. The effect is small, so I have to zoom in to show it to you, but we can measure this difference in relaxation rate or difference in coherence time of a mean of about, or sorry, the median of about 22 milliseconds with a range of about uh, 70, 12, 12.4 to 75 would be the range of coherence time differences. And so the way to state this is if you took away all the other sources, you'd be stuck at four milliseconds. If you then shielded to get rid of the radiation, I could maybe give you a 12 to 75 additional milliseconds of coherence time uh, just by shielding. That's a small difference. The statistics though indicate that it is significant. That is not just a, a null result. And so I can summarize that uh, both of those like this, um, same information, but a different way of looking at it. We have one data point with fairly large bars, but it is not consistent with no effect at all. So that's the difference in co the, the difference in relaxation rate we would have expected versus that's a ratio of powers. We don't know our internal power well. And so we're trying to estimate what would happen if you could control these powers independently. Uh, the projection of that number is done with the value of A that we measured in the radiation experiment. So there, there's a lot more detail. There's a paper on the archive and it's out for peer review now. Uh, and so just to conclude, there's a, there's a very significant problem, quasi-particle poisoning. Uh, it, it significantly limits coherence time. Uh, and we did a two-part experiment to test that it's caused by radiation. Uh, and we observed that at least in part that it is, but we found out that radiation is not the current leading cause of decoherence. There is something else limiting us to 100 microseconds. Only at the few milliseconds level will it come in that we have to start worrying about radiation from the environment. So, so what if we're right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a nuclear physicist. I want detector technology. So I believe that understanding how I can get from these high energy radiations that, that represent the physics I'm interested in to very low energy quasi particles. That is a very sensitive detector. So I'm in it for some detector technology. I'm sure we can improve our neutrino physics if we can understand the microscopics of that. For, for, for QIS, you know, this is how you learn to, to make better devices. Maybe you can make your devices less sensitive. You can shield or go underground to get away from that radiation. And eventually you'll start having to worry about the radioactive radioactivity of the materials you make the qubits out of themselves but we know how to do this. That's all. All right, thank you very much. You. Questions? Mark. I think you might have... Hello, anyway, does it work? Can't tell. So anyway, I think, it, I think you might have mentioned that in the sense that you didn't know your internal power, but I was wondering, did, um, are you able to assess the contribution due to the materials intrinsic to the device? So, so, so we, we, we did do some estimates early on in this work, and, and as long as we were going to be on a lab in the surface, there, it was going to be negligible. Like we actually know about what's typical for aluminum. Silicon is actually really clean. Uh, the copper we know these things. We actually we did model that. It is, it, it's probably negligible. So doing crazy stuff like growing your own superconductor underground, that, that, that's going to come in way past the millisecond scale. The, the, the first bit is just to get away from concrete buildings and cosmic rays. Any further questions? Behind you. Oh, over there. How much better could you do at snow? Well, uh, let's see. I guess the way to do it is to read it off of that. Um, I mean, that's pretty, pretty much ideal right so, now so, on Earth. So, 
so, so I, I think maybe the answer is here that if, if I could get rid of all the other sources. <sighs> Snow is the Sudbury Neutrino okay, Observatory, yeah, so three 6, kilometers down. <laughs> 6,800 meters of water equivalent. I forget. Oh, here. So I believe by getting rid of radiation, you know, I can get you somewhere in that range more milliseconds of coherence. So, so that, that's, a, that's what I got. Actually, it should but be better than get, that. That doesn't get rid of the cosmic. That's what I'm saying. Actually, yeah, so it actually should be better than that. It, it may oh. be up to like 100 milliseconds. Okay. I, I don't know enough yet about okay. the different uh, radiation powers and, and how they matter. Do you have plans to go? <laughs> it, you know, it could actually be that cosmic rays matter more. Cosmic rays are charged. You know, they, if, if it matters more, <laughs> coupling directly in the aluminum versus, the, you know, coupling through phonons from x-rays that penetrate for a while before they interact. And then underground would help with those a lot. You know, under, underground would help more actually than shielding from the x-rays from the concrete. We, we, we will likely do this. We have a shallow underground, underground lab at PNNL. We, we, I don't have the money to do it yet, but I want to put a dill fridge down there and kind of repeat this experiment. Because even, even shallow, you get, you're down to like 1% of cosmic rays just by going 30 meters down. Uh, so with, with the processing times of these kinds of quantum computing circuits, uh, the microsecond scale is good enough for some depth of circuits. Uh, is the millisecond scale good enough for like the foreseeable future of depth of circuits? I, I think millisecond is what it takes to be like a, a, a good useful NISC device. So, you, I mean, ideally you want many milliseconds. Yeah, yeah. You, four milliseconds will not get you the quantum computers you want. Okay. Any further questions? If not, then uh, let's thank him again. Thank, thank you. you. And the next point is a guided discussion. So I will hand the micro microphone on to Michael. Okay, can you guys all connect to the shared document? Can't do that. There's a slight delay with the speakers, and there's this effect when you hear yourself slowly delayed. You can't speak properly. Uh, that's Google Drive beside you over there. Yeah. He emailed one out earlier, I think. Uh, Yes, you should have an email from me. If you don't have an email from me, uh, if you let me, let me put it on the, I'll share it on the screen. Oh, that's actually really hard. I have to share the link. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I can put it in the chat. I'll just leave the I got the other microphone. Yeah, yeah. I can hear myself. Okay, good. Can someone in the back speak? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we can hear it. So did you send it to all the registered addresses? Uh, I think so, but let me put it in the Zoom chat. Uh, I guess this is for everyone. <clears throat> yeah. What's the Zoom? And the Zoom address is 262 160 053. That's in the top left. <clears throat> All right, um, so what I would really like to establish, I know some people have to leave so they won't be here for the discussion this afternoon, we'll do more fun stuff next, but I really want to know how we can develop the collaborations here in the Pacific Northwest and where we can go with that. So I'm looking for um, input from everyone about what you are interested in and uh, any ideas on how we can do this. So a couple of questions just to pull here. Um, how, how do people feel about using something like uh, Google Drive for, for the whole area to share some ideas, collaborative documents? Does anyone have suggestions for better technologies they've used for this type of thing? 
but I'd like to get people's input. I'd like to increase the feedback and the rate at which we communicate with each other. Is that, are people willing to contribute to something like that? Or you need an email address, there are privacy issues with Gmail, but it generally works. <laughs> UDOP and WSU have access to this. If you're in an institution that doesn't have G Suite, then you'll need to use the Gmail, okay? If you're interested and willing to do this, then at the bottom of this document, if you can just put your name, so here's an example, I put me, put your name, give me an email address that you'd like to be communicated with at, and then if there's another one that you need, then a Gmail address so that I can share, we'll share a drive, we'll create a drive, we'll drop everything. So you, then you can have to use the email address? Well, address. if you want to do a drive, you have to. So if you want to be able to drop documents in there as well, not just one shared document, then you need to have some Gmail. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so WU Dub has G Suite. If, if your institution has G Suite, then that'll work fine too. But if it's not a G Suite or a Google, then we can't do it. And if someone has better technology, we can discuss this there and move over to there. Right? So we use. Uh, I don't know if you all can hear me. But, um, we use Slack for. Uh, so yeah. So please, the first thing then your task is to just fill out this bottom form. Add your own uh, a bit of information about you how you're connected to, what, what your areas of expertise are, uh, so that people know, and then what areas are sort of where we want to trust, and then at least will give us a place to look at to find out what's here and that sort of serve our um, The collaborations generally seem to be much better. Looks like audio is not working. Hello? Can you? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Nathan says chat. Slack works well for collaborative discussions and documents. Um, oh, your audio is not working. Can you hear us, Nathan? You can hear us, but we can't hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't know how to enable that right now. Don, we can take a look and see if there's that. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so Slack's an option. I don't know about that technology, but I'll, I'll pick, I mean, I know about it. I haven't used it in detail, but I'll look into that as well. See if we do that. How many people here use Slack? Just so show of hands. If it goes on for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I know there's an issue. You can't keep it for documents for a long time. That was one thing that sort of stopped me from using it. Um, okay. All right. Uh, okay, so we'll collaborate some things there. Few body interactions work really well for establishing collaborations, right? So meetings face to face like this are really good, um, but they also have a fairly high barrier. Uh, Zoom does work pretty well. The problem with Zoom meetings is that then people don't quite take it as seriously. Um, but I think we should try and, and, and have small or large scale meetings a little bit more frequently so we can have a stronger interaction. So that's one thing that we can try and do. Uh, I'll set up a Google space for this. I really like to sort of collect, I mean, it's a big community, and connecting computer science with engineering, with materials, with physics, with quantum algorithms, that there's a lot of different language. And so sometimes we have to speak the same language or we have to explain what we're doing in a language that's understandable by the whole community. And I'd like to have a place where, at the bottom, that's sort of where, what your expertise, but where we can really, I have a hard time keeping track of what everyone's doing and knowing the full extent. So I want a place that I can look at and really understand what's available in Pacific Northwest. So those are the types of things I'm thinking about. Um, and then we have a fairly good experience with Zoom, so we can organize meetings that way. Uh, I think that's getting a little loud. No, I think these are all on, so it should just be that one. Um, what ideas, what would people like to see for Additional workshops. I don't want to talk the whole time. I think it's it's human. So, like, how much, what fraction of people from that is it? This is a pretty small fraction. So this is just like the, mostly the physics, AMO, ion community, and not even the complete one there. Um, but we have pretty good representation here. Then there's a whole bunch of people doing quantum algorithms, development of the digital stuff, but they're not here, um, and that are part of. Yeah, that, or that could be, that are maybe, right? I mean, and we don't have any of the industry connections right now here. Yeah. So there's also, yeah. Yeah, so there could be like a dozen people from Microsoft being here nine more, but you didn't know. Like the nuclear here is going to be really here. Yeah, we can double that. So you think you're slightly in the Northwest, there's only 200 people working on it? 
across the whole umbrella at the bottom. Are we actually including grants? <laughs> yeah, yeah, put students in there, yeah. So, yeah, so, so, so it's a big community. It's hard to keep track of it all, but yeah. So I'd like to, any ideas and any direction, this, this will be my attempt to try and do it. We may fail, but yeah. So I just have a question for everyone who wants to be for faculty. Um, how much of a difficulty is it for you? Because Michael mentioned having these workshops along with that. How difficult is it for you to leave for the semester and go potentially to the community? Is that, is that a, a barrier at all? Or is that pretty uh, pretty reasonable for you? I'm just asking because I'm just curious if that's if that would be a potential barrier for people to not be able to go to workshops that work a little bit more often. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if it, if it was like, I don't know, what were you thinking, Michael? Two or three times a semester? Twice. Maybe somewhere there. It'd probably be good to have one or two in person and then a couple other ones focused on things that we can connect to Zoom so it doesn't affect schedules as much. But. So one day versus two day workshops would make a difference. Do you want to travel for a one day workshop? That's a region that makes more sense, right? Like a quick flight to London as opposed to you know, flying to East Coast for a day. Or Friday, Saturday. Right, so, yeah, we had some issues with space for this one, but yeah, that, I, I mean, we can send you guys right there. Yeah, we <laughs> It's bad for people to Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because you don't have daycare on you or So we can put daycare on you. It's like, yeah, yeah. There you go. We did that for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. What, okay, fine, fine. Uh, another thing I'd like to discuss, okay, if, yeah, anyone please add to these documents too. Um, big issue is the training we want to work for. So we've, we've heard this discussed in several areas. Uh, there's, there is a large need here, but we need to sort of, at least I don't have an exact idea of what that means and, and sort of how to do it. I'd like to sort of see paths for people who are trained and make sure there's jobs for them at the end of that training. Uh, I have questions about what that training has to be. As a physicist, I think there should be a very strong physics component to that, but it's possible that you can make big advances that some people have when they basically have just the bare bones mathematical description of quantum mechanics and you play with algorithms. My view on this, coming from an analogy with computer science, is that if you can do make advances with algorithms from with just the high level computer science uh, picture of this, but when you want to make it performant, you have to understand something about the hardware. And so I think the same thing a hole for quantum, but I don't know. What do people think about this? Ideas? I put ideas in the, in the workforce development part. Of, okay. um, I didn't realize that there was a whole discussion. Well, that. we'll put those up there at the end. That's where it should go. That's true. That's true. One, one additional step that we've made here at WC was we started a, a quantum computing seminar course. That was a, um, we, it was student led, so we had each student giving a, each week's worth of presentations for a particular topic. Quantum information to give us all you know, a leg up on technology and, and concepts that aren't in the normal curriculum. But I'd be curious to hear if any of the, any of the other guys from, from other universities have anything interesting in the quantum curriculum that's not standard. One, one thing that I think we had a number of programs maybe talking about, I'm sure you mentioned this about how you know, if you really get into it, all you need is um, some kind of linear algebra that can go through the matrix. And most of our quantum sequences, I think, are still kind of the old fashioned start with the historical wave function and then get up to that. And so we're, we're currently, as part of quantum algorithms, are essentially trying to uh, uh, reach a quantum mechanics stream so that we can get students exposed to the uh, matrix models uh, right away. And in a way, that doesn't require much background physics if you may bring in computer science engineering to uh, figure out how to bring in wave functions traditional stuff uh, later. One comment on that, uh, because it's something that Kevin and I have been thinking about, but is the, I generally find, so I think in terms of pictures, you have to look not everyone does, I find that the algorithms are very algebraic, and I think people can make really big advances, and at least the people I know can make advances, they think more algebraically than geometrically, and so there's sort of a question of, the wave function is nice, because you can draw it, pictures that way, but the matrix stuff is like, that's the direct path to getting results, and how to bridge those is a tricky problem, but yeah, 
Did you put block spheres next to all of your little games? I don't know yet. We're thinking about putting block spheres next to all of your little games. But uh, yeah, I haven't figured out the full version of it. But yeah, but it's, it's, it's an interesting educational program for us. But yeah, definitely, I think we have, there has to be something that streamlines that process. But we need to, do you, do you have some results for how effective that is and how, from the student perspective? We, we haven't done it. You haven't done it yet. Okay. Um, no, we're, we're still finding. So I don't have first hand experience on this, but I know at UW, the undergrads have three queries of quantum, and the first query is basically all about the uh, uh, two by two matrix. Do they have some results on how effective? I don't. I don't. Okay. Because this is this is. A, I mean, it's very different for us to think about how effective we think it might be and how effective it actually is for the students. But yeah. Okay. Any other? I mean, that's like there's. I don't have like statistics or anything, but like what I've like through this, I found like the matrix stuff started like things felt like they were falling into place a lot more than when you start with the wave function. Like, but I mean, I think there's probably different approaches because. A lot of it was like you're just doing integrals. Like that doesn't really feel like stupid. Like, like you're just learning how to do integrals and see how that I think we uh, so we have different uh, faculty members teaching the upper level on the graduate school department. I think each faculty member actually tried different approaches. Some of them put a lot of emphasis on the algebra. Uh, really, it's not working the same way, but for students, my perception might be different. Well, the other thing the algebraic wise, a Canadian, you can be done in Yes. But not all students respond very well to that. That's Math. A, that's yeah. A, yeah, that's a bit of abstraction. Yeah. Are there any efforts to do more interdisciplinary curriculum? As which I was talking about is to try to make your Going for a you know a quantum course it's not just for physicists but it's also for computer science and engineering that's going to have to be a more collaborative effort an interdisciplinary inter college effort frankly uh, and, and I think that would be really cool but I don't know, I don't know if anybody's seen any activity in that way so uh, at UNESCO as an NRT proposal to do exactly what you say basically um, so it's it's designed as a three quarter so full year after half quarter. Uh, academic sequence uh, where basically uh, chemists and material scientists students they go through a course that introduces them to concepts that are not in the area of expertise but they uh, so basically we have quantum information technologies for material scientists course in the first quarter then physics um, uh, is quantum information computation course so basically kind of more or less standard course and then for computer scientists and uh, electrical engineers, there's a course on introduction to quantum computing and algorithms. So they're kind of preparing them to kind of have roughly a uh, similar and sufficient background to the second part, which is actually practical, work with simulations of quantum computers. So we partnered with uh, several companies that will offer um, that. And then um, finally, they have uh, some advanced projects <clears throat> and capstone projects, including internships in these companies. So that's the, the vision for this. And that actually is across uh, colleges, across departments, uh, involved a lot of faculty. So, um, yeah. yeah. What about sharing of materials and lectures, notes, and things like that? Uh, that yes. Open source? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this is all written in. Yes. Okay. Can you pop links to that also in the docs here? Uh, well, it's a pending proposal, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll work out that. <laughs> yeah, so, so when, it's a bit, when stuff like this is available, yeah. Sure. That is a, that is a really good idea to, to not, make, not try to make a single course that's interdisciplinary, but to kind of try to focus on right. the different so, majors. Because a lot of times people see that their course is cross listed and they see it's kind of quantum mechanics or something, and they're just like, well, I don't want to take that. But like, it doesn't sense, like, <laughs> maybe we're going to be so with our quantum. One person from math and one person from computer science, but that was all of 